Chapter 12 The Growth of Knowledge From Ignorance to Knowledge The acquisition of knowledge and the build-up of knowledge is by its very nature always a process of the passage from ignorance to knowledge, from not knowing things to knowing them. Whether we consider our knowledge in general, or our knowledge of some particular thing, it is always the case that the first we knew nothing and then gradually acquired knowledge. Hence, in his encyclopedia article on Karl Marx, Lenin wrote that the theory of knowledge must study, quote, the transition from non-knowledge to knowledge, unquote. We must not regard our knowledge as ready-made, he wrote, but must determine how knowledge emerges from ignorance, how incomplete, inexact knowledge becomes more complete and more exact, unquote. Materialism and Periocriticism, Chapter 2. Many philosophers, on the other hand, have taken it for granted that knowledge can only be derived from previous knowledge. Therefore, they have supposed that there must be fundamental certainties from which all knowledge is derived. This leads them to two opposite but equally misleading conclusions. On the one hand, they invent various principles which they say are certain, and then claim that they know and have proved all the propositions deduced from these principles. On the other hand, they deny a great part of our real knowledge, because it cannot be so deduced. Thus, for example, philosophers have deduced all manner of conclusions about God and the ultimate nature of reality from first principles, and on the other hand, they have rejected the whole of our knowledge about the material world on the grounds that it cannot be justified by anything that they are not prepared to accept as absolutely certain and self-evident. Yet the real starting point of knowledge is not knowledge but ignorance, and not certainty but uncertainty. We always build up knowledge from a previous state of lack of knowledge. Hence to try to build up systems of knowledge from self-evident premises is to misunderstand the whole problem of building knowledge and must always be in vain. How then is knowledge built up from ignorance? This is done and can only be done through our sensuous interaction with things. It is done by human brains which, as we have repeatedly said, are the organs of the most complicated relations between man and the external world. By the perceptual awareness of things which results from entering into various active relations with them, we come to know them where previously we did not know them. And the more various the relations with things into which we enter, the more do we consequently get to know about them. Hence, knowledge is the product of our consciously entering into active relations with things. The transition from lack of knowledge to knowledge is wrought by human activity passing from lack of relation with things to relation with things. For instance, we did not know the source of the Nile, we got to know it by going there. We did not know the composition of atoms, we got to know it by performing experiments. We did not know the distances of the stars, we got to know by devising methods of measuring them. We did not know the laws of development of human society, we got to know by consciously striving to utilise them for bringing about a new stage of social development. Section. Perceptions and Judgments. The first requisite for the build-up of knowledge is obtaining perceptions, that is, making observations arising out of various relationships with things. First we had no observations relative to something or process. Then we obtained such observations. This is the first step. Without performing it, there can only be ignorance, not knowledge, either blank ignorance or else, as often happens, ignorance camouflaged by illusory or speculative theories about things. Secondly, having entered into relationship with things and obtained observations about them, we must go on to formulate judgments or propositions about them and their properties and relations. We must employ the laws of thought, that is, the logical laws for the reflection of objective reality in terms of ideas, in order to express in ideas, in judgments or proposition, the results of observations. The build-up of knowledge always involves the passage from sensations to ideas. All the higher animals have sensations, and in their sensations possess definite, concrete information about things which they learn to make more reliable and which they use in their life activity. But only in man is this information provided by the senses converted into knowledge, in the sense of being expressed in ideas and propositions. Here we understand the term, quote, knowledge, unquote, in the definite sense of human knowledge. 
The sense in which, for example, a dog knows the way home is different from the sense in which a man knows the way, for in the latter case it is expressible in the ideas and propositions which can be communicated. Ideas and propositions are communicated, shared and discussed by people in their social life, and it is in this expression of information in ideas and proposition which constitutes the essential feature of human knowledge. People acquire and possess knowledge just as insofar as they pass from the sensations, which are particular to each individual and which they possess in common with all animals, to the ideas, judgments, propositions which are socially communicated and are particular to man. Perception by itself, then, is only the condition of knowledge, but not as yet its realisation. The knowledge of things possessed by man is achieved by passing from sensations to judgments founded on sensations. Thus, knowledge is always being built up by a continual cycle of qualitatively distinct activities, which together make up the whole process of knowing, entering into active relationships with things, obtaining from this relationship perceptions and observations, formulating judgments out of the observations, utilising these judgments to direct the further active relationships with things, leading to further observations, further judgments, and so on, without end. Section. From superficial to more profound judgments. Sense perception reproduces things as they immediately appear through their action on our sense organs. The senses give only particular pieces of information about particular things, conditioned by the particular circumstances under which we are perceiving them. By expressing the information obtained from perception in propositions, people arrive at judgments expressing conclusions from the comparison and putting together of many particular data of perception. Quote, the first step in the process of knowledge, wrote Mao Zedong in his essay on practice, in which he summed up the essentials of the materialist theory of knowledge, is contact with the things of the external world. This belongs to the stage of perception. The second step is a synthesis of the data of perception by making a rearrangement or reconstruction. This belongs to the stage of conception, judgment, and inference. Unquote. For example, from many perceptions of many members of society we reach such conclusions, all of which represent elementary items of social knowledge, as quote, dogs bark, cows give milk, water turns into ice in cold water, unquote, and so on. Such judgments are, as Mao expressed it, quote, a synthesis of the data of perception, unquote. To form such judgments about things depends not on a single observation by a single person, but on several or many observations by several or many people. And the more various the observations, the more various the circumstances in which and the angles from which they are made, and the more various the changes and relationships of the object which they cover, the more comprehensively and faithfully can the judgment reflect the objective properties relations and forms of motion of the object. Observation is itself an activity, since we must consciously bring ourselves into relation with something if we are to observe it, and must bring ourselves into more varied relation, noting various different aspects of the thing, its various changes and so on, if we are to observe it more fully. But observation itself passes from what may be called passive observation to active observation and it is the latter which is of primary importance for building up fuller knowledge of things. Observation in itself does not change that which is observed. In this sense it is passive. A bird watcher, for example, obtains knowledge about birds, but he does not interfere with them in any way in making his observations. On the contrary, in this case he must be very careful not to do so. Active observation arises when we ourselves, by our activity, take a part in bringing about various changes in things and observe the results of the relationships or changes which we ourselves have affected under our own control. One of the most important methods of active observation of things is, for example, to measure them. The process of measurement, whatever it may be we are measuring, involves bringing one thing into relationship with another thing and noting the results. Other methods of active observation are, for example, to break something down into its parts or elements and then to reconstitute it again, or to affect changes in its properties through the agency of other things. In general, by elaborating methods of active observation suitable to the different things we want to know about and what we want to know about them, 
we obtain many significant observations leading us to conclusions about their properties, relations, motions, laws of motion, causes and effects, composition, and so on. Having acquired, through both passive and active observations and their translation into judgments, a certain body of knowledge expressed in judgments, we can then make use of this knowledge in order to obtain more knowledge. For it will suggest new fields of exploration and methods for establishing new relationships with things. Knowledge already built up is utilized for the direction of more activity and the obtaining out of it of more observations. By this means, the knowledge already built up is further tested and corrected, and the whole build-up of knowledge is continued. The process of passing from observation to judgment, and then from more active and comprehensive observation to more comprehensive judgment brings about, in the first place, a correction of immediate conclusions based on insufficient observation. Ordinary experience already teaches us that there is a difference between the first appearance of things in sense perception and their reality. For it often happens that things turn out to be different from what they first appear to be, and this is shown in practice by the non-realization of expectations based on first appearances. In the process of building up knowledge we are always passing from conclusions which express only the apparent properties, relations and motions of things to conclusions which approximate more fully to things as they really are. For example, when we perceive the sun it looks a relatively small body, and for a long time people concluded that it was in fact quite small. But we have come to know that the sun is in fact very big. Again the sun looks as if it goes round the earth. And for a long time people concluded that it did in fact go around the earth. But what we have come to know, that is the earth which really goes round the sun. In the second place, in the process of forming more comprehensive judgments about things, we pass from fragmentary knowledge of particular things, with their particular properties, relations and motions, to more connected knowledge of their laws of existence, change and interconnections. The first knowledge which is based on the first observations of things is knowledge of a number of facts about those things, but not of the laws of their existence and the interconnections between them which manifest themselves in and determine those facts. At the same time, therefore, as we correct the conclusions based on the first appearance of things and form judgments about their real properties, relations and motions which give rise to the appearances, we also form judgments about the general laws and interconnections which are manifested in the particular properties, motions and relations of things first evident to observation. For example, having established the main facts about the solar system, that the planets of which the Earth is one, go round the Sun, we also establish the laws which are manifested in the system and by the operation of which it exists and remains in being. Again, Knowing from common experience that water turns into ice when it grows cold enough, we go on to establish as a result of the synthesis of, and inferences drawn from, many special observations. The reason for this phenomenon namely, that it is due to a rearrangement of the molecules caused by changes in their motion when the temperature is lowered. Thus, in the process of passing from observation to judgment, we also succeed in passing from superficial to more profound judgments from judgments which simply state what we have observed to judgments which go further, and draw conclusions about the composition and the internal organization of things, about their causes and effects, interactions, interconnections and motions, and laws of interconnection and motion. This is a qualitative change in the content of judgments, a passing from judgments of superficial content to judgments of a more profound content, from judgments in terms of elementary ideas to which correspond objects directly perceptible to the senses, to judgments in terms of abstract ideas which state the causes, reasons, explanations, effects and laws of the things we observe. Section From superficial to deeper knowledge We can conclude that knowledge in general is realized only by passing from perception to judgment, and that then the process of developing the knowledge expressed in judgments of extending and deepening it, passes through two qualitatively distinct stages. First, the superficial and fragmentary knowledge of things directly derived from perceptions of them, and second, knowledge of their essential properties, interconnections and laws. In the first stage, our judgments express merely what Mao Zedong called, quote, the separate aspects of things, the external relations between such things, unquote. In the second stage, 
we arrive at judgments which, as he expressed it, quote, no longer represent the appearances of things, their separate aspects of their external relations, but embrace their essence, their totality and their internal relations, unquote. The passage from the first stage to the second stage involves in the first place active observation. Without active observation, the data on which to found more profound and comprehensive judgments will be lacking, and any judgments which may be made can only be speculative or illusory. In the second place, however, it involves a process of thought arising from observation, a process of sifting and comparison of observations, of generalization and formation of abstract ideas, of reasoning and drawing conclusions from such generalization and abstraction. Having reached conclusions, they must be again checked with active observation, in order to ensure that they accord with it, and that the abstract generalizations reached by thought do express the concrete facts given in perception. The passage from the first stage to the second stage therefore involves a passage from judgments which directly express the data of perception, to judgments which are derived from the data of perception through a process of abstraction and generalization. The passage from the judgment that the sun is hot to the judgment that its surface temperature is about 6,000 degrees centigrade represents, for example, such a passage of knowledge from the first to the second stage. The judgment that the sun is hot directly expresses one way in which the sun affects our senses, but the judgment about its temperature involves, first, that we have formed the abstract idea of temperature, and second, that with the aid of this idea we have reached conclusions about the sun's temperature by an elaborate process of active observation and reasoning based on it. As a result, we pass from a judgment which merely expresses certain observations about the sun to one which expresses its internal state. Again, suppose that we are considering the state organisation of a given country, of Great Britain let's say. The first observations which may be made concern particular facts such as that the capital is London, that laws are made by people sitting in two houses of parliament, that these laws are signed by the Queen and enforced by policemen, and so on. Many inquiries into the character of British parliamentary democracy never get further than formulating the judgment summarising such observations, which means that they go no further than the first stage of knowledge. If, however, inquiry is carried further, if the state is considered in its historical development on the basis of the whole development of the economic structure of society, and if reasoned conclusions are drawn from this inquiry, then we will arrive at the judgment that the British parliamentary state is the organ of the rule of the British capitalist class. This is to advance knowledge of the state to the second stage, which embraces not merely a number of observed facts about it, but its essential nature. In his work on the theory of knowledge, on practice, Mao Zedong wrote that the first stage of knowledge is confined to, quote, two separate aspects of things, the appearances, the external relations of things, unquote. Where in the second stage it, quote, takes a big stride forward to embrace the wholeness, the essence and internal relations of things, discloses the internal contradictions of the surrounding world, and is therefore capable of grasping the development of the surrounding world in its totality in the internal relations between all its aspects." Unquote. Many philosophers, those belonging to the so-called empiricist and positivist unquote, schools, have denied that knowledge develops through two such stages. According to them, first we obtain various quote, sense data, unquote, and then we compare and relate these data in order to formulate the judgments or propositions summarizing the observations. And for them, that is the whole process of knowledge. Hence for them, knowledge is entirely confined to, quote, the separate aspects of things, the appearances, the external relations of things, unquote. And it is an illusion to suppose that there can be any more profound knowledge of things, of their reality as opposed to their appearance to us, of their essential properties, interconnections and laws. In opposition to this empiricist or positivist type of philosophy, Marxism traces the growth of knowledge from a lower to a higher stage. First of all, in obtaining information through the senses we pass from sensations to judgments, and then in the development of our knowledge expressed in ideas and judgments, we pass from superficial knowledge of the appearances and external relations of things, to deeper knowledge of their essential characteristics and internal relations. Section Appearance and Reality 
In passing from elementary to abstract ideas, from superficial to more profound judgments, the passage is made from the appearance of things to their reality. In considering knowledge, a distinction must always be made between appearance and reality, between the particular phenomena which are immediately evident to observation and the hidden processes, interconnections and laws which are manifested in the appearances and underlie the observed facts. The task of knowing things is always to advance from appearance to reality, so as to get to know more about the real movement and interconnections of things manifested in their particular existence and mode of appearance. Thus Marx stressed the task of science is always to proceed from the immediate knowledge of appearances to the discovery of the reality, the internal connections and laws underlying the appearances, and so finally to reach a comprehensive understanding of the appearances. Inquiry, he wrote, quote, has to appropriate the material in detail to analyse its different forms of development, to trace out their inner connections. Only after this work is done can the actual movement be adequately described. If this is done successfully, the life of the subject matter is ideally reflected as in a mirror. Unquote. Capital preface to the second edition. So Marx stressed that knowledge of the real character and laws of any subject matter must always be derived from a detailed analysis of the relevant facts, and must in turn serve to explain them, to demonstrate their inner connections and actual movement. His own work in the social sciences provides examples of this point. Thus, in Capital, Marx pointed out that whereas the vulgar economists dealt only with the surface appearances of capitalist economy, Scientific political economy seeks to uncover the real relations of production underlying the appearances and on that basis explain the appearances. If the underlying processes had been evident on the surface to superficial observation, there would have been no need for further profound inquiry. But the reality is never evident on the surface and can be discovered only by painstaking scientific analysis. Quote, the way of thinking of the vulgar economists, wrote Marx, derives from the fact that it is always only the immediate form in which relationships appear which is reflected in the brain, and not their inner connections. If the latter were the case, moreover, what would be the need for a science at all? Unquote. And explaining his own method of scientific analysis of capitalist economy, he pointed out that at the end of it, quote, we have arrived at the forms of appearance which serve as the starting point for the vulgar, ground rent coming from the earth, profit, interest, from capital, and wages from labour. But from our point of view, the thing is now seen differently. The apparent movement is explained, unquote. Letters to Engels, June 27, 1867, and April 30, 1858. It is clear from this, incidentally, that the positivist philosophy which confines knowledge entirely to dealing with surface appearances was completely in accord with the procedures of the, quote, vulgar economists, unquote, whom Marx criticised, and their procedures were completely in accord with it. This philosophy, indeed, is the most suitable philosophy for the apologists of capitalism, whose whole outlook depends on their never looking below the surface of social life. As a vivid example of the importance of judging things, not from superficial appearances, but from the point of view of their inner relationships and connections, we could take the case of wages. If we judge only from external appearances, then wages are simply payment for work. A man works so many hours and is paid so much per hour. In that case, we could perceive no difference between wages in, say, capitalist society and in socialist society. Whether he works in a capitalist or a socialist factory, a man works so many hours and gets paid so much. What is the difference? The difference is that the external form of wages expresses different social relations. In capitalist society, wages are the price of the worker's labour power, which it has sold to the capitalist. In socialist society, wages are no longer the price of labour power, since the factories belong to the working people who do not sell their labour power to themselves. Wages now express the allocation to the worker of a definite share of the values he has produced according to the work he has contributed. So while in capitalist society the workers can maintain or raise their wages only by fighting the capitalist class and threatening to strike, in socialist society they continually raise their standards by increasing production. In other words, the laws which determine wages are totally different in socialism from capitalist society. 
but why they are different can only be understood when we go behind the appearances of things and seek to discover the inner relationships and connections which determine the appearances. Section Revolutionary Theory and Revolutionary Practice To pass from superficial to profound judgment about things, and from their appearance to their reality is, as we have said, to pass from one stage of knowing things to another. Such a qualitative change in knowledge is also as a rule a revolutionary change. It is revolutionary because it brings about a revolutionary change in what we can do. When practice is guided only by what we have learned concerning the external appearance of things, then it lacks the power of knowingly bringing about profound changes in those things, or of utilising them extensively for far-reaching purposes. On the contrary, when we know things only by their appearances, we generally have in practice to wait on what happens, to adapt ourselves to things, often badly and suffering surprises, setbacks and misfortunes, rather than mastering them and adapting them to purposes of our own. But when we begin to grasp the reality which determines the appearances, then we can deal with things more effectively, bring about profound changes in them and utilise them for our own purposes. For example, up to modern times people had only superficial knowledge of chemical processes, and so there could be little effectively planned use of these processes and production. But modern chemistry enables us to break substances down and bring them into being again from their constituents so that many materials can be made by synthetic methods with properties to suit our own requirements. We can split atoms, break down one element into others and utilise the energy produced in the process and even create new man-made elements such as plutonium. Again, the utopian socialists and the old working class movement could not effectively change society, but Marxist theory, which penetrates to the reality of social processes, has enabled the working class movement thoroughly to transform society in some countries and to begin to build socialism. Whether we consider knowledge of nature or of society, whenever knowledge has been raised to knowledge of reality, and not only of appearance, then this has been a revolutionary development, a revolution in what people can do. Such profound advances in knowledge, whether they have been consciously linked with practice or not by those who played the major theoretical part in affecting them, are always in the last analysis the products of revolutionary strivings in social practice. It is when people strive to do something new so as to increase their powers and improve their conditions that they experience the necessity of deepening their knowledge. There can be no revolutionary practice without knowledge, for without knowledge it lacks direction and cannot attain its goal. A leap forward in knowledge is a condition for the realisation of a revolution in practice. It is impossible to raise the level of knowledge apart from, or in advance of, the corresponding practice, just as practice gropes in the dark without the necessary knowledge. Apart from the appropriate practice, no genuine knowledge is possible, but only guesswork and speculation. All genuine knowledge arises out of practice, and in turn is tested in practice. Though this does not mean that the theoretical deductions from a discovery may not advance beyond the carrying into effect of all its potential practical consequences. There is no other way to discover the laws of the real world than the way of entering into practical relations with objects and processes striving to master and change them, forming concepts on the basis of the experiences gained, and then testing the theoretical conclusions once more in living practice. Section. Things in themselves. It follows from this analysis of the growth of knowledge that, in all its stages, it is the growth of the faithful reflection in human consciousness of the objective world. Many philosophers have maintained that our knowledge is limited to the appearance of things in our own minds, and in that, quote, things in themselves, unquote, things as they really are, quote, in themselves, unquote, and independently of how they appear to us, must be unknowable. According to such philosophers, there is an impassable gulf between the data of sense given in our consciousness on the one hand, and the things existing independently of our consciousness, things in themselves, on the other hand. And many not only deny that we can know things in themselves, but also that such things exist at all. And yet already in judgments directly based on perception, we are gaining knowledge of things in themselves, 
not only in the first place complete or profound knowledge, but knowledge at least of various separate aspects and external relations of things. We gain this knowledge precisely by means of the data of sense, and when further investigations of reasoning, we reach conclusions about the relations of things, their properties, the processes into which they enter and their laws of motion, then we are gaining deeper knowledge of the very same things existing independently of our consciousness of them, which before we knew only superficially. There is then no gulf between things in themselves and their appearances or quote phenomena, unquote. We know things precisely by means of their appearances to us, and the more we study the appearances, the more we can find out about things. Nor is there any gulf between the appearances of things and their reality, since the appearance is a manifestation of the reality, and we do not know the reality separately from the appearance, but only through it. Quote, if you know all the qualities of a thing, you know the thing itself, unquote, wrote Engels in the Introduction to Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. We know about the real properties and relations of things by practice and study, by finding out what we can do with things, and by studying the various appearances of their various aspects under many conditions, we gain more and more knowledge of the things themselves. Hence all our knowledge is knowledge of real things, which certainly exist independently of their appearance to us. Quote, the materialist affirms the existence and knowability of things in themselves, unquote, wrote Lenin. In materialism and imperial criticism, chapter 2. First, we know things superficially through perception, and then more deeply and comprehensively by thought operating with the data of perception. There is and can be no difference between the things known to us and things in themselves. The only difference is between what is known and what is not yet known, and between what is known only superficially in certain of its aspects and what is known more thoroughly. Section. Overcoming the Limits of Knowledge Are there, then, limits to human knowledge? At any particular stage in the development of humanity, knowledge comes up against limits set by the necessarily limited character of the experience available and of the existing means of obtaining knowledge. But humanity advances by overcoming such limits. New experience throws down the limits of old experience. New techniques, new means of obtaining knowledge throw down the limits of old techniques and old means of obtaining knowledge. New limits then once again appear. But there is no more reason to suppose these new limits absolute and final than there was to suppose the old ones absolute and final. At every stage there are people who think that the limit has been reached and who look no further. But there are always, sooner or later, other people who throw down those limits and boldly advance beyond them to new limits. Therefore, knowledge is always limited, and advances by overcoming existing limits. For example, it was impossible for people in feudal society to know anything about socialist society and its laws, to formulate the truth about socialism and the transition from socialism to communism. This became possible only with the development of capitalist society. Only then did the means become available for forming a scientific conception of socialism. Similarly, it is impossible for us today to know how a fully communist society, after it is established, will further develop, but in due course people will be able to ascertain the truth about this further development and its laws. Again, it was impossible to gain knowledge of the atom and its structure before the invention of modern techniques of electronics. Today with these techniques we have passed what we once thought to be the limits of all possible physical knowledge. These techniques themselves involve, however, their own limits to physical knowledge, so that now some physicists assert the impossibility of ever knowing anything more about subatomic processes than is allowed for in contemporary quantum theory. But it would be both dogmatic and short-sighted to assert that these limits are any more absolute than were the once insurmountable limits of other techniques in the past. Quote, While yesterday the profundity of this knowledge did not go beyond the atom, and today does not go beyond the electron, wrote Lenin, dialectical materialism insists on the temporary, relative, approximate character of all these milestones in the knowledge of nature gained by the progressing science of man. The electron is as inexhaustible as the atom. Nature is infinite. Unquote. Materialism and Imperial Criticism, Chapter 5 At every stage and in all circumstances, knowledge is incomplete and provisional. 
conditioned and limited by the historical circumstances under which it was acquired, including the means and methods used for gaining it, and the historically conditioned assumptions and categories used in the formulation of ideas and conclusions. But this development of knowledge, every stage of which has such a conditioned character, is a development of knowledge of the real material world, the discovery of interconnections and laws of motion of real material processes, including human society and human consciousness. It is a progressive development in which the bounds of knowledge are stage by stage enlarged, in which the agreement of ideas and theories with objective reality is stage by stage increased, and in which, stage by stage, what was provisional and hypothetical gives place to what is assured and verified. The progress of knowledge always comes up against barriers, which arise from the limitations of existing knowledge and existing practice. But while the progress of knowledge always faces barriers to further advance, knowledge progresses by finding out how to get over them. End of chapter 12